Good. Good morning. Good morning. Um, some of you all have commented on how you love the way that I watch Ruth. Well, you're misinterpreting that because you think it's just uh, love and affection. But after 41 years, I still don't understand why she married such a person as me. And so I'm always watching her because I just expect at any moment she's going to leave, you know, and, <laughs> and, and realize come to her senses and, and finally say, why did I do this? But uh, I wish... I wish I could take you back to our first baptism uh, in Malawi, uh, wow, 35 years ago. You know, sometimes we're just a bunch of wimps in the West. We, we get this baptistry, and you fill it full of warm water, and, and you fill it almost chest high, and, and, and all you've got to do if you're from the immersion tradition, you just have to go, whoop, whoop, and you're done, all right? But... What if you've got 300 people like we did that first baptism, 300 people, and the water is about this deep? I mean, you can give yourself a hernia in about 10 minutes, and, <laughs> and, and, and it'll wear out six, seven, eight, maybe more uh, evangelists and pastors because that, that's, that's a lot of hard work and a lot of healthy men and women, and, and it was rainy season, and they just couldn't wait to... You know, they already had 300 people been waiting for a while to baptize, and so uh, we had a, I guess our boys were six and four then, and we went way out somewhere in the river to baptize, and rivers up, and immediately as we got there, the, uh, the, the, the lead pastor uh, sent uh, uh, three deacons upstream and two deacons downstream, and so I, I went over to him and said, what are you doing? He said, well, the water's really, really fast. And, and he said, I can't be expected to hold on to everybody. And, and, uh, and he said, uh, it, 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 people get washed away. The deacons downstream catch them. And, and, uh, and, and I said, well, okay, so what about upstream? He said, the river's full of crocodiles, and, and those deacons are to keep the crocodiles out of the bab baptismal service. And, and I thought, uh, I said to him, I'm, I'm feeling called to go downstream, and uh, I'm, I'm really impressed by the Lord, and, and, uh, but I could tell really quickly which deacons he liked the most. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, just, you just need to, 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 to pay attention to things, and um, we've, we've sort of set a biblical foundation as we continue this conversation day to day, and have centered ourselves in in Matthew 10, and uh, even uh, tomorrow, uh, we'll look even deeper in Matthew 11 and, and talk about that vision statement of Jesus that he, he's come to seek and to save those who are lost and, and that he, he sends us out as sheep among wolves. And yesterday, I think we made a, by the looks on your faces, we made a, a really strong case, a really strong case uh, that our task is to rescue those who are perishing, and that we have to pray both halves of the prayer of Jesus and pray, Father, when tough times come, let this cup pass, but always, always, without stopping, without putting a period in the middle of the thought, we pray, Father, uh, your will, not my will, be done. You see, one of the things that I probably should have said yesterday, but it will serve to remind you well, uh, Ruth and I, along with just uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of obedient servants, have attempted to take the gospel to the darkest corners of the planet, to, to the heart of evil. And if you think that Satan gives up his territory without a fight, the only way you could know that is that you haven't tried to take his territory away from him. And, and when you go to the heart of evil, uh, you pay a significant price for that. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a trade that's easy to make uh, for the eternal uh, destiny of those wolves that will say yes to the kingdom of God. Um, Satan has two desires. And it's not what you think. Satan does not want to beat you. He doesn't. Satan doesn't want to put you in jail. He doesn't want to imprison you. 
He doesn't want to take your children from you. He doesn't, though this is what he does when he has to. He, he doesn't want to, to, to make you lose your job and the way you support your family. Uh, Satan has two desires. And the first is he wants to keep you from having access to Jesus. Now, write that on the hard drive. Because what we're doing this week is reconfirming that we have chosen sides in this spiritual battle. And if we have chosen, and since we have chosen sides in this spiritual battle, uh, there are certain things that we have to do when we've signed up for this fight to really show whose side that we're on. So Satan has two desires. One, he wants to keep you from having access to Christ, and I am very concerned that he's been widely successful in this, that after 2,000 years of Christian history, how can there be 2.8 billion people that don't even have a verse of Scripture in their language, don't have the Jesus film, don't have the first worker? Tomorrow, we're going to ask you to change that. Tomorrow, we're going to invite you to actually stand up, spiritually speaking, and say, as far and as long as there is breath in me, I will push back the darkness to that 2.8 billion people have access to Jesus. He has two desires, Satan does. One is to keep you from having access to Jesus, and failing that, what he wants to do is to shut you up, make you keep your faith to, you, to yourself, and, and, and again, as we've said, you can die in your sleep of an old age in the worst persecution uh, environments on the planet if you'll just keep Jesus to yourself. But if you keep Jesus to yourself, you have chosen the side of the evil one. Because what Satan wants the most is to keep the people around you, in your families, in the homes that you grew up in, in the businesses that you work, with the people that you walk by on the street, and those in the furthest corners of this planet. He wants to keep you from giving them access to Jesus. And when you keep your faith to yourself, remember what I just said, Satan's number one desire is to keep people from having access to the Son of God. And when we keep our witness to ourselves, we may say in our hearts, we may say through baptism, we may say through church membership that we are on the side of the light and on the side of, of, of Christ himself. But if we keep Jesus to ourselves and we therefore fulfill the first deepest desire of evil, it's my prayer that God will not let you sleep at night because you have the souls of the nations in your hands spiritually. You see, we walked out of Somalia with four believers left alive. And if you were to ask my wife even, because I had not expressed this to her, four years before this, when, when we were finally told that we don't know how to do, Ruth and Nick, what you're doing. And, and that turned us loose to, through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to find out how are you to be New Testament people in an Old Testament environment. You're in a country right now that increasingly acts out its belief that there are only Old Testament solutions for Old Testament problems. And it has to do with killing them before they can kill us. It has to do with oppressing them financially before they can oppress us. Now, we're, we're not talking about a government. We're talking about the governments of the world. There is not a government that I know on this planet that says to its citizens, we want you to die for our enemies. And yet Jesus makes that audacious, not suggestion, command of us. So we're choosing sides, and it's not 
an internal decision that does not have an external application. When we choose sides, we're going to attack Satan in his strongholds and give people, men and women and families, singles and marrieds, access to the kingdom of God. We, we walked four years before uh, uh, we went on this journey among believers in persecution. Uh, Ruth and I had made a proposal to our mission board to develop a discipleship resources for those of us uh, who serve in the hard places, and, and you've gotten an uh, introduction to that, really, just an introduction to that so far uh, this week. But that's, that's not where my heart was. I watched the entire generation wiped out, buried a son. And my heart was saying to God, Jesus, are you a one-off? Are you capable today in Mogadishu, in Afghanistan, in, in the hard places on this planet, can you reproduce today what you did in Israel 2,000 plus years ago? Or was that a one-off? Folks, if I can't be honest with God, who can I be honest with? Now, that's, I wasn't expressing doubt. I wasn't expressing a lack of faith. I'm just honestly saying, God, uh, 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 was that a one-off? And using... Have you, have you ceased to do what you did for the salvation of Israel unto the ends of the earth? Or are you still in the business of redeeming entire people groups and countries? And that's why I went to believers in persecution under the subterfuge of doing research because I, I, uh, I, 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 I had to find out if Jesus is up to the task today. And I, I have to believe that if I keep Christ to myself, the answer is no, I don't believe he's up to the task today. He, he, has, he has, dare I say, become distracted? Or, or is it just to get a small portion of the world into the kingdom of God and, and, and then stop? Or is he about changing the hearts of entire nations? And uh, when we went to the Soviet Union, out of the first 50 people that we set at their feet, listen, we found out in a hurry who was Paul and who was Esther and who was Timothy. That's one of the biggest mis misnomers in modern missions is that you think we're sending you out to be the Apostle Paul in a culture that you don't look like Local people, you don't sound like local people. You have to come from thousands and thousands of miles away and learn language and learn culture. Listen, the moment, the quicker that you can discover that we are to go to the nations and sit at the feet of the Apostle Pauls and the, the Esthers and the Ezekiels that God is always raising up inside of these cultures and that we are to learn from them and to serve them and to carry them their suitcase for them. And, and, and we always pray over local believers the prayer that John the Baptist prayed in concerning Jesus. We're always praying that we might decrease so that our local body of Christ might increase. It's not about us. It's not about us. And out of the first 50 people that Ruth and I sat at their feet and had them mentor us, um, when we listened to them and, and just uh, listened to what they were living, what scriptures they were living their lives by, if we asked them, and we did, what is your life's verse that everything else is stacked around, 35 out of the first 50 men and women that we set in their presence to learn from them, they said the, the scripture in which that, 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 that it, 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 it stimulates and, and dictates all of our lives is Revelation 2.10 to be faithful unto death. We're faithful until we change staff. We're faithful until we get a youth director our kids don't like. We're, we're faithful even if the temperature is not... Uh, the way we want it. Oh, folks, folks, you're going to hear today uh, the, the row. Well, I'll just save it. 
I'm just going to save it. Just be thinking about what churches are splitting over in the modern day is the very thing that God wants to use to let us live the resurrection, and yet we're using it to beat up on one another, and, and hopefully it'll come to my mind at the appropriate time. But that's what I want chiseled on your hearts. That's what I want chiseled on your actions. And when they ask you, why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you crossing the street? Why are you putting your lives at risk? Why are you putting your kid's life at risk? Why, why are you doing this? And you, you will have chiseled on your hearts, I must be faithful unto God unto death. If that is your starting place, what can make you quit? And so got to the Soviet Union and wondering if, 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 if Jesus can replicate in Mogadishu, it was obvious that it hadn't happened, can he replicate in the Soviet Union and China and India among the great religions and, and the minor religions of the world? Is Jesus capable of doing today what he did that is captured in Scripture, or are we just studying an old book, a book of history? And I, uh, the fifth person I ever sat with, uh, I had this interpreter named Walter Muscatovich. I don't think he was five feet tall. And all five feet of him was pure energy and passion for Jesus. He was 86 years of age. And after we sat and, and talked to the first four people, he looked at me and he said, now I've got you. I, I know what you're looking for. He said, be at the front of the hotel at... Uh, at uh, at, at 5 o'clock in the morning, I'll have a driver. We're going to take you five hours north of Moscow, and, and there's a man there that you need to talk to. He's just come out of prison after 17 years in the worst prison in this area. Uh, did I tell him about my hotel room, Mama? Because that did I, do, did I tell you about that piece of paper I left in my hotel room? Okay. I don't know what you're like, but everywhere we went in those days, uh, uh, you were followed. And every room, you just assumed that it was bugged. And, and every day, every night, I'd come back sometimes 3, 4 o'clock in the morning because uh, I had to interview believers when they were available, when they, th where they thought it was safe. And, and I'd come back, and for weeks and weeks, you could tell that somebody had gone through your clothes, and somebody had moved your papers around, and, and obvious that they're looking for something. And, and you know, I, I don't know how you are, but us Kentucky boys, we don't like somebody messing with our boxers when we're not there. <laughs> well, we don't like to do it when they're, if we're there. But... Uh, <laughs> And, 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 and so I just, you know, it's just, it's a way I say mentally healthy. You'll think the opposite. But I, I tore off a piece of paper and wrote on it, to whomever is searching my room, thank you for leaving my clothes in a neat order. And I just put it on my pajamas and closed that uh, old dresser drawer and, and went out, came in at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm so exhausted. I'd forgotten what I'd done, and I opened up that drawer, and oh, there's that piece of paper there, and somebody had written on it, you're welcome. <laughs> There, there's, there's a principle of life. Everybody likes to be commended for doing a good job. <laughs> and, and, and so I show up at 5 in the morning, and we drive, and we come in the middle of winter to this house that's so small you could put in here about six times. And this bent, stooped over, twisted guy met us in the driveway, and he had big inflamed scars, and, and he couldn't stand straight, and his shoulders didn't line up. And if I had to guess his age, it was going to be well over 110 years of age. And I was shocked to find out that he was just um, uh, 63 years old. And he brought me into his house, and he put a chair against the outside wall of his house. 
And he put a small table that's about three times bigger than this. That was their dining room table between me and himself in a chair. And he began what he said. He said, he said, Nick, come. I want you to sit here because this is where I was standing when I was arrested and taken to prison uh, for 17 years. I said, I don't want to sit there. <laughs> it didn't turn out very good for you. So why would I want to sit there? And he said, sit down. I said, okay. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, you don't mess with a guy who's been in prison for 17 years. And he tells me the story of being an engineer. His wife is a school teacher. Uh, folks, it is ingrained in a lot of places in the former Soviet Union. It is ingrained that real church, real church is bricks and mortar and literacy and ordination and licenses and, and seminaries and the whole nine yards. And if you don't have real church, there is no possibility of meeting God. And this guy had been brainwashed that way for generations. And, and he went fear and trembling to his wife and said, Honey, you know that, you know, in the first 60 years of communism, they had so massacred and compromised pastors that in his community, his village, there used to be six to eight churches. Now the nearest church is three days walk away. How often would you go to church? What do you do? Tell your communist boss, I need a week off because it's three days walk a full day of worship and three days walk back, uh, how often they're going to let you off work out of school so you can go worship the one true God. And, and he went to his wife and he said, our kids are growing up without any kind of religious training. And he said to her, don't be angry. Don't be mad at me, please. And his hands are shaking. He's, he's terrified at what he's going to suggest. And he says, uh, uh, don't be mad at me, but I just want to get the boys together a couple times a week and, and just read the Bible to them. And Don't be mad at me. Uh, they, they don't get to go to real church. We've got to do something. And she'd been praying for years that he would step up and and, but you guys, if you're married, you already know this. Uh, she, she didn't say, well, it took you long enough. She said, oh, honey, I don't, I'm so proud of you. You're so spiritually discerning, and you're so aware of what God wants to do. And every culture I've been in overseas uh, absolutely believes that the man is the head of the household, but that the woman's the neck, and she can make that head go any direction she wants to. <laughs> And if you are a man and you laughed, that's because you're not married. <laughs> Take it from an expert. And, uh, and, and so he, he began to read the Bible to his kids. And, and when I met them, they're grown. He, they said, Dad shook with fear. But as they, as they went through weeks and months, they learned to tell the stories, and the kids would act out and tell the story back, and they would say, Daddy, Daddy, can we sing the songs we sung when we went to real church? See, even at six, seven, eight years of age, they were already brainwashed like that. So are we. Tornadoes swept through the South less than a month ago. It was on NBC News when we watched it. And the guy stood there outside the rubble, not a brick on brick, not a board on a board, and said, we're going to be great. Uh, the church, this is not the church. The church is the people of God, and, and this is not the church. Not any of the church was harmed. And I said, praise God. But what did they do the next week? What did they start doing the next week? Building the building back. Building the building back. The, the question that was before Dimitri and before us, if they take the blessings of God away from us and we don't have this and we don't have our institutions of Christianity, we don't have our church buildings, can you still feed yourself and your family and those around you, singles, can you feed yourself on the, the heavenly bread when there is no building. Can you be an Abraham? Can you be a Daniel? Can you be an Esther who knew that the altar of God is not confined to a building? 
We'll talk about that more tomorrow. But, you know, you're in a village. You can't hide anything. Everybody knows what you had for breakfast and lunch. And, and, and some of the village people came to him and said, listen, we can't go to real church either, so we want to come worship with you. And he said, no, absolutely not. This is not allowed. This is not a church. It's not consecrated. There's no cross here. I have no training. I'm just doing this with my boys. We're just praying and, 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 and reading the Bible and singing a little bit. And they said, we can't go to real church either. And he couldn't find a way to stop them, so they started coming to his house when they watched the family gathering for worship. When it got to be 25 people in this little tiny living dining space, and, and the man of God is standing up here, and he's still terrified, the KGB arrested him, or they took him into the headquarters, and they terrified him. And, and it's not what you think. They did physically threaten him. But what terrified him is that they said to him, you have started an illegal church. And this man got in the face of the security police and said, how dare you say such nonsense as this? I'm not ordained. I'm not licensed. This, uh, my, my house is not a church. All we are doing is reading and studying the Word of God and talking about it. All we're doing is singing. All we're doing is praying. All we're doing is every now and then taking some money and giving it to the widows and the orphans in the community. How dare you call this a church? Well, what would y'all call it? <laughs> it's church. It is a principle of persecution that haunts me that the persecutors always, thus far, thus far after 72 countries, the persecutors always know when God, the Holy Spirit, is up to something new and fantastic and miraculous because Satan is terrified when the Holy Spirit shows up and his antennas and his evildoers and his demons are out there watching for the presence of God and then immediately they will react against it. It is a principle of persecution that I detest that the persecutors always seem to know when God is up to something new and mighty long before the church does. Because we don't expect God to do anything other than what we have designated in an order of service that he does, usually on an hour on Sunday morning. If God was to show up in might and power, he better do it between 11 and 12 o'clock on Sunday morning. Right? Please, please, Make this untrue in your lives. When it got to be 50 people in this small room, now, Dimitri's been talking to me now for three hours, and he's just using a normal voice. He said, Nick, when it got to be 50 people worshiping in this house, he said, uh, they fired me from the factory. They fired my wife from being a school teacher. They kicked our three sons out of school. He said, you know, Nick, little things like that. And my heart almost stopped. I said, I thought to myself, little things like that? Can you ever imagine hearing yourself saying that? That because I'm worshiping in my house with my neighbors, that I lost my job, my wife lost her job, we lost all of our income overnight, our kids are kicked out of school, never to return. And you see that? as a little thing? And I'm asking God, where's this going? You see, I had challenged Jesus, and he's about to show up. And Dimitri said when it got to be 75 people in this room, and they're standing shoulder to shoulder and hip to hip, and now the man of God is ordained by the Holy Spirit, and he's sharing the Word of God with confidence, and the back doors of his house are thrown open, and here comes a 43-year-old KGB colonel with 15 of his killers into that house church, and he's throwing people off to the side like uh, Moses parting the Red Sea. I usually get Moses and Noah mixed up, but I think I got it right this time. <laughs> the story's still the same. And, uh, and, and throwing people aside, and they came up to the man of God where he's now speaking, and they began just to 
snap his head back and forth and slamming him against that wall into those uh, two by four studs and, and within minutes his ears are bleeding, his nose is bleeding, his teeth are loose and his mouth is swelling up, his eyes are swelling up and they throw him against the wall one last time shaming him in front of the body of Christ and said we've warned you, we've warned you, we will not warn you again if you don't stop this nonsense this, there, there's going to be really bad things happening to you. And they turned and did their little persecution parade out of the, out of the house. And when they got to the back door of the house, a, a, a babushka grandmother uh, uh, just twisted with arthritis, stepped out of the midst of the packed crowd, and she stood and she took an arthritic finger and she stuck it up in the face of that KGB colonel and she prophesied over him, and you can use whatever words you're comfortable with. She said, you have mishandled the man of God and you will not survive it. This was on Tuesday and he died on Friday. What's the moral of the story? Don't mess with grandma. <laughs> And if you're paying attention, if you're paying attention, Ruth and I just shared with you who to evangelize in the most difficult of places on the planet. Because there's things they'll do to you at 20 and 30 and 40 that they won't do to grandma and grandpa. Who you choose to evangelize will determine how fast persecution comes and how initially how severe it will be. I just saved you years and years. You can plant churches and get to a movement in 10 or 15 years. If you'll listen carefully, the Holy Spirit's teaching us how to get there in three or four years. And the next time the church met, 150 people showed up. Well, they couldn't allow that. They took him to a prison a thousand miles north of his house. And they put him as the only, listen to me, he's the only believer in a prison filled with 1,500 hardened criminals. The worst persecution ever done to believers in persecution is to isolate them and to put them away from the body and to isolate them and put them off by themselves somewhere else. What are our people doing? The moment they don't like the sermon, the more they don't like being told to tie. They're, they don't like being challenged to witness. They, they don't like sitting more than 60 minutes in, in any week in, in worship. And what we do is immediately just take ourselves out of the fellowship and persecute ourselves so Satan doesn't have to do it. It's, it's just very common to watch that. And, and listen to me, those of us who are from the United States, always we found that the covert persecution, the quiet, under the surface, whispering covert persecution is always more effective than the covert, overt persecution. If Satan can shut you up quietly, he'll never beat you. He'll never put you in jail. Take your job. Take your kids. He will never cost you your life. And he's telling the story of everything that they did to him. And, and I, I just couldn't stand it after four hours of these stories. And I just leaned across the table and I just shouted in his face. I said, how did you take this? How did you stand this? I don't understand. How, 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 could, how, how can you be sitting here today? And he looked at me, just with the same look on his face that I've seen on Ruth's faith a thousand times. He, he just said, I, I was about to tell you if you just listen, you know. <laughs> I'm saying, I thought you have never met Ruth, you know. You all been talking behind my back. And, and he said, Nick, I had two disciplines, practices in my life. I learned it from my father, who learned it from his father, who learned it from his father. Uh, it's been passed down generation after generation to my family. And he said, every morning as the sun came up, I would stand uh, by my bed. He had enough room to go to his, the door of his cell, enough room to go back to the toilet and sink. And there's just cages, acres and acres and acres of cages 
uh, floors of cages. Uh, There's concrete pillars in every corner, oozing sewage, uh, oozing water, freezing in the wintertime. And here's the man of God. Every morning as the sun comes up, he stands by the bed. He faces the east, and he stands at attention. And as the sun comes up, he raises his arms in praise. And he said, this is the first time I ever heard the phrase, I would sing my heart songs to Jesus. Can you imagine what the prisoners did around him? How they laughed, how they jeered, how they threw old food at him, human waste at him, rattled their cases, cages as your brother is there in a sea, not of just lostness, hostile lostness, arms raised in praise, singing his heart out to Jesus. And he said, Nick, whenever I could find a scrap piece of paper, a piece of charcoal, whatever, I would rush back to my cage and I would write every scriptural verse, every Bible story, every scriptural song, depending on the size of the paper that I could remember. And and I saw this as my offering to God for those 17 years. And he said, often I would stick it on that wet concrete pillar and it only stayed there until the jailer saw it and, and saw the content of it and he would tear it into shreds and then they would come in and beat him because of his offering to God and nothing nothing because of these disciplines because of what he learned from his father's 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 father and on his mother's side too they couldn't break him they couldn't shut him up they couldn't stop him from singing until he went a thousand miles broke into his house and stole his wife's clothes. She didn't have but two sets of them. Took her hose, took her purse, took her shoes, and they came and took a common criminal lady and cut, dyed her hair, made her look as much like his wife as they could, and they dressed her in everything they had stolen from his his home, from his wife's closet, and they, they walked her about from here to this back wall, made sure her face is away from her, and they drag her in this men's prison, screaming and kicking and and crying out because she knows what's coming, and they take her to that interrogation room, and, uh, and, and groups of men for the next 72 hours come in and out of that room doing what you can imagine what they did to her, and he's listening to her cries get softer and softer and softer, and on the third night she dies. And they wrap her in a blanket and drag her right in front of his cell with just an arm leg hanging out, recognizes the purse, the shoes. And they say to him, she's dead, you're next. And he sits on his bed and he says to God, I'm done, I quit. I can't do this anymore. You can't ask this of me. And he tells his guards, he says, I'm ready to sign the the confession. All he had to sign in 17 years was that he was not a follower of Jesus and that he was being paid by Western governments to overthrow his government. And they said, now it'll take all night to get these drawn up by the lawyer. We'll have them here in the morning. You sign them. You're free to go. He said, write whatever you want. My wife's dead. I don't know where my kids are. I've got to get out of here. I've got to find them. And he sat on the bed and he said, I quit. And that is universal for believers in persecution. Listen, Uncle Nick, open up your tender hearts. Even Jesus himself, the very Son of God, did not have the strength to carry his cross by himself all the way to Calvary. And you can't either. And there are times when our brothers and sisters It's why the Bible commands us to pray for and to stand with our brothers and sisters in chain because if we don't carry them, they can't finish their journey. And when it becomes your time to be persecuted, are you willing for them to pray for you to the same amount that today you're praying for them? It's that serious. He said, write what you want. I've got to get out of here. And a thousand miles to the south, his wife, his three boys, and his older brother sense the despair of this man of God, unusual despair, and they come where I'm now sitting, and they get on their face before God in a circle here, and they cry out to God for this husband, this father, this brother, and the Holy Spirit of the living God 
allowed him to hear the voices of his family as they prayed for him. And the next morning they came with that confession and his shoulders are straight, his back, you know, his, his, his eyes are firm, it's filled with power, his whole body language is, is filled with the presence of God and he tells them what they can do with that confession, that he was not going to sign anything. And they said, what happened to you? We had you defeated, we had you beaten. At last we had destroyed your spirit. And he said, Almighty God allowed me to hear the voices of my wife, kids, and brother as they prayed for me. I not only know that my wife is alive and that you're a liar. Uh, I know more importantly that she's still faithful to Jesus. And she, he said to them, get out of my cell. And he threw them out. <laughs> he learned something from grandma. <laughs> he said to me, Nick, two weeks later, I'm out on the exercise yard where only I walk. And on the ground is an entire piece of paper blank on both sides with a pencil laying on top. He said, I knew. He said, there's no other answer than God sent one of his angels to put that there for me. He said, I rushed back, and for the next four hours, I wrote as tiny as I could, every Bible story, every Bible verse, every scriptural song I could remember. And he said, I knew not to do it. He knew. He said, but how can I not give Christ the greatest offering I've ever had, ever done? And he put it as high on that concrete pillar as he could. It didn't stay there five minutes before the guards saw it. And when they saw it was on both sides of that, they came in, and they started taking your brother to pieces. And they drug him out of his cell, and they said, you you, you can see through those bars over there, and you can see the posts through those bars, and you can see the ropes tied to those posts. You know what's going on here. You've been here long enough. In 15 minutes, you're going to be tied to one of those posts. In 20 minutes, we're going to shoot you dead. And they drug him down the hallway and then had to cross over to go to the other side. And as they got to the door of the execution yard, 1,500 hardened criminals stood at attention beside their bed. 3,000 arms were raised in praise to God. And they began to sing that song they'd heard the man of God saying all of those years. And the guards let go of him in terror. And they said, who are you? And he said, I am the son of the living God, and Jesus is his name. I've got a doctorate. What am I going to teach this man about the kingdom of God? This man terrified me. There were times in Somalia where physically I knew I'd never see my wife and kids to death. But this is the most dangerous guy I've ever met up to that time in my entire Christian life because if he represents normal biblical Christianity, do I know who Jesus is? Do I even have a clue about the kingdom of God? I had challenged Jesus, and when he showed up, it was the most terrifying event in my life. And we're answering the question, why do some churches, when they're told to desist and to shut up and to keep their faith inside of the walls of the church, they never come out, they never witness, they never cross the street, they never share Christ again, and yet you can't tell any difference from this church to this church on the other side of the street, and they tell them to shut up, and nothing makes them shut up. They, they will proclaim Jesus even at the last beat of their hearts. Why Why does this church uh, stumble and fall and never gets off the ground? And this church lives the resurrection as if they're following the very living Christ himself, which they are. Why do some of the body of Christ get knocked down and stay down and others, when they're knocked down, They get up and they wipe off the dirt and the blood and they keep walking toward the go and the high calling that is in Jesus Christ. Why? What's the difference? Well, because of time, I'm going to have to be more like Ruth because I wanted you to hear the story. And if we took three or four hours today, I, I, I I could... 
tell you story after story after story, but what I want to do for you is to list for you the characteristics of the DNA of living the resurrection. When we see these who are knocked down and get up, we see these who are prison for, uh, we've been with people who've been prison from three years to 31 years. We've sat at their feet from three hours to two days. And they reminded us of our Old Testament and New Testament biblical heritage and what it means to be a child of the living God whose name is Jesus the Christ. Number one, Ruth and I have been married 41 years. And I, uh, I, 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 it's one of the greatest mysteries in human history why she said yes to me. If you don't believe that, you should have asked her parents. <laughs> <laughs> that was not a pretty sight. But it was one of the most holy experiences when we went to ask Ruth's father if I could marry her. We did not have a good relationship because he knew me too well. And and he knew his daughter's heart. And as I asked him if I could have, um, I didn't ask for his daughter's hand. I wanted all of her. You know, I didn't want just a hand. And, uh, and uh, I never, I've never understood that. That's weird. And, uh, and, and he, he never looked at me. He never even acknowledged that I was in the room. He looked at Ruth and said, Ruth, all of your life since the third grade, all you've ever wanted to do was to serve Jesus as a missionary overseas. Where does this figure into that calling? And Ruth was able to look her father in the heart and say, uh, Daddy, that, that is, the, that is the, the foundation, the beginning part. That's, that's why uh, 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 Nick and I fell in love is because we want to give our entire lives together to be among the nations. And he looked at his daughter and said, as long as you are obedient to God, I bless this marriage. What a witness. What a powerful testimony. I have never forgotten that. And in 41 years of marriage, I talk about Ruth and I look at Ruth like I don't do any other woman uh, any any other guy, and that'd be weird, on this on this planet. And 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 here's the point. When when we look at people who are living the resurrection and we're listening to their earliest memories and to their life story, when they begin to talk about who Jesus is to them, everything changes. Their body language, their tone of voice, their eye contact, I'm warning you. Listen, 8% of communication are words on a piece of paper or a computer screen. Email will get you in trouble. As you know, text will get you in a whole lot of trouble. But communication, 90-some percent of communication is body language, eye contact, tone of voice. And when they begin talking about who Jesus is to them, they talk for 15 and 30 and 45 and more than an hour. And, and you look them in the eye and you watch their body and you listen to their voice. There is no one no one, no spouse, no child, no leader, no mentor on this earth to them like Jesus is. And you will understand. And you know this already. You, you can get a big following. You probably can increase your offerings. All you have to do is tear down Islam and condemn uh, Muhammad as a pedophile. And, and, and you can get so many amens from that. But that's... Not what we've been told to do. We've been told to lift up Jesus. And when we lift him up, all the nations will be gathered to him. If we listen to your story, what am I going to see in your eyes? What about your body language, your tone of voice? How, how long are you going to be able to talk about your relationship with who Jesus is? And he's so much more than a magic prayer that gets us, we think, into the kingdom of God. And then we can divorce ourselves from God until our death days. They know Jesus. Secondly, y'all listen to them pray and fast. Y'all listen to them pray and to fast. 
I was with a Chinese guy. They, they snuck me into his apartment, one-room apartment, uh, uh, right after midnight. Told me I'd be out on the street before 4.30 in the morning because I had to get out of the area before the sun came up. And this man had been in that prison four blocks away for 31 years. And folks, they had so abused him and tortured him and psychologically, mentally uh, 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 messed with him that he will not be right until he's at the throne of Jesus. And I sat with him for four and a half hours, and he, would, he had one table, one light bulb in his apartment. He had a porcelain plate with a big old spoon and a knife and this huge family Bible that stayed open over there. He had a tiny cot, a nail in the wall for his coat. He had a piece of wood hanging in the wall with three canned goods on it. And that was his world. That's his world. And he fasted four days out of every week. And he would begin to tell me his story. And he become so broken over what had been done to him in that prison four blocks away. And he gets so broken, he'd just start to cry. And he'd go over and open up his Bible. And he'd start quoting and reading and singing the Psalms to his Jesus. And he'd do that for 20 to 40 minutes. And then he'd look around and see me and say, where did you come from? How did you get here? And then I'd reintroduce myself, and we'd talk for another 45 minutes and get so broken over what they've done to him. And they took his wife, and they took his kids. He doesn't even know if they're alive now. And, and he, he'd go over that table, and he'd just cry out to Jesus. I wasn't surprised two months after I met him that he died because there was more of him in heaven that was in that room. And I just know, I just know, he's sitting at that table crying out to God and telling Jesus all of his troubles. And when he raises his head, Jesus picked him up and said, you're home. You're home. Well done. Well done. They know Jesus. Folks, believers in persecution generally can recreate 70% of the Bible stories by memory. What I'm doing with you is I'm pushing restart. I'm from a culture that normal Christianity is placed about six inches off the floor. And what I'm going to describe to you is normal Christianity is somewhere in the resurrection. And normal Christianity will be realized when you finally get in the presence of Jesus. We're going to push restart. They know Jesus. They, unbelievable, listen to them talk to God. Uh, uh, You listen to me talk to Ruth. I don't talk to another person on earth. We have our special language. We know each other's thoughts. They know the very heart and mind of Christ. They, I was with, in Soviet Union, there were 700 young people 18 to 13 years of age, never married, never touched a Bible. Never touched a literate Bible. And three charismatic pastors had about a thousand house churches, but they're doing the, here, here, here's, here's practical stuff we learn. They're doing their security so well that the bad guys can't find them. But if you do your security so well that the bad guys can't find you, other Christians can't find you either. Seriously. So you got to take risk. Otherwise, all of us feel like we're the Elijah in the cave. And so they know of a thousand churches, and these young people don't know of their own house church. Usually it's their parents and their uncles and aunts and their ugly cousins. And you do that for a few years, that gets old. It gets old. And so they brought them in to Moscow. This is years ago. And, and they didn't really have a program. They just wanted them to meet each other and, and see on a broad scale what God was doing. And they just, in the moment, said, let's just see. None of you have ever had your own Bible. Highly literate. Uh, let's see how much of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John you can create by memory. And how many songs, hymns, and choruses you can commit to memory reproduced by memory, and at the end of the week, after being in small groups, they came together and they recreated the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they made six mistakes, and they had never touched the Bible. I am submitting to you, that's normal Christianity, and they recreated 1,000 
200 songs, hymns, and courses by memory. 1,200. And I, and I must say, look at that one word, indigenous songs. When we ask them, we ask them, uh, as we listen to their whole story, it, it, can, you, can you make a synopsis for us? Uh, what kept you strong? What helped you to grow? What helped you become the person you have in, in the worst persecution that we know of on the planet? What, what helped you grow and, and be in Christ? And, uh, and what's your verse? What's your song? And they always had a song that they sang to Jesus, their heart song. If I, we ask them that question and they say to us, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, or blessed be the name, or, or how great thou art, or any of the modern songs that we might know, if they are singing music from the outside, we know. We are absolutely certain of one of two things. Either they've not gone through enough persecution to write their own music, or they've gone through persecution singing our music, and they have failed God. 100% of the believers we've met that are living the resurrection had heart songs they sang to Jesus, 100%. Zero, zero, and this hurts, ever told me I remembered a sermon I heard that kept me strong in persecution. Moses said, God said to Moses, that which I am saying to you, the message I give to you is too important for Israel to not to remember in Deuteronomy. Five times he said this, go and get the choir and sing it to them. They know, they know large portions of the Bible and they, listen, the Orthodox Church in Romania for years sung hymns gathered from the Western world. And then there was a charismatic movement called the Army of God inside of the Orthodox Church, led by a guy named Constantine and others, and they put Constantine in prison, and in prison he wrote 600 hymns and choruses and songs, and today, today they are singing Constantine's prison music. It swept the land. And that only comes through the crucible of suffering. So I'm going to have to get on with the list. They, they know... Uh, next, that they are prayed for, that they're not forgotten. We have emphasized this. They, they, this one I could spend an hour on. They know, listen, keep your money in your pocket. They know that the local body of Christ takes care of their families. You go 100% of the time to prison, and there's your elder, there's your deacon, there's your evangelist, there's your church planner, there's your pastor, and you ask your pastor, pastor, how are you doing? He will never answer you. He'll say, how's my wife? How's my kids? How's my family? How's my church? And you know what the church will say to him? Pastor, your job is to be obedient to God in prison. Our job is to take care of your family. You do your job. Let us do ours. You know what we call that? We call that church. And when church breaks out, you don't have to tell the body of Christ to take care of its children. I'm not going to look at you because I have to tell this story. They put a Baptist pastor in prison and they tortured him for nine months. They put his wife and kids in Siberia in a house, one room house, and moms, you've eaten your last crust of bread. Your kids have had their last sip of tea. It's 30 below zero, and they're going to bed hungry, cold, afraid, thirsty. Mama, where's daddy? Mama, what's going to happen to us? Mama, are we going to die? And mother has to be father and mother and say to the kids, kids, we've taught you all of your life to be obedient to God and to trust God, and this night is when we put that in effect. And 30 kilometers, 20 miles away, God wakes up a deacon and says, get up out of bed in the middle of the night, harness the horse, hitch him to the sled, put the food, the vegetables, and the meats that the church has gathered, and take them over over there to pastor's family because they're starving and, and they need the body of Christ. And the deacon says, Lord, you don't understand. It's 30 below zero out there. The horse is going to freeze and I'm going to freeze. And the Holy Spirit said, go. 
And he said, God, you don't understand. There's wolves everywhere. They're going to eat the horse, and then they're going to eat me. And he said, the Holy Spirit said to him, listen, you don't have to come back, but you've got to go. Thus saith the Lord. Now, that's not what we're going to tell your parents the first time we meet them. (laughs) Because you should tell them. You don't have to come back, but we have to go. The local body of Christ takes care of its children. They know that their suffering is for Jesus' sake, and they know that their persecution is normal. And we talked about that very, very, uh, very deeply on the first day. And the next two are, are so uh, psychologically true, they have claimed their freedom and they've lost their fear. You go to the Chinese who are allowing the house church to meet in their house and on their farm. If you don't stop this, the Chinese authorities, the, the uh, Mama, what are they called? P, PSB. Uh, um, uh, if you don't stop this, we're going to take your farm, we're going to take your house, and we're going to throw you in the streets. And you know what the response is? Then we are free to trust Jesus for our daily bread. If you don't stop this, we're going to beat you. Then we're free to trust Jesus to heal us. If you don't stop this, we're going to put you in prison then we are free to preach Christ to the captives and set them free. If you don't stop this, we will kill you. Then I am free to go to heaven. Listen, freedom is not the purview of any government on this planet. It is from the throne of God. And you can never successfully persecute any believer who knows and claims their freedom from the throne of God. And they've lost their fear. When you are afraid, you give Satan. You give Satan's number one tool. Number two, number three, and number four tool is your fear. And when you are afraid, then it invites Satan into your physical environment and gives him a presence he would not have otherwise. Believers have told us time and time again, there's 366 verses in the Bible about fear. God has given us a verse for every day of the year and an extra verse when there's a really bad day. Claim your freedom. Lose your fear. And finally, here... Here's where you're going to write yourself in the story. I go place after place. I'm forever changed. I'm in Russia. And I hear all these stories. And my soul cries out, where did you learn to live like this? Where did you learn to die like this? That's a good question. And he said, I remember, Nick, my daddy came and got me and my sister, my little brother, and he went into the kitchen sit in the chair, only warm room of the house, and mama's crying. And daddy said, kids, tomorrow I'll go to prison because I refused to give up pastoring the church. I had a friend in the police that called me today that tomorrow I'll be arrested. And he said, kids, listen to your father. All over this area, they are hanging entire families to death who refuse to give up Christ. Nick, my father, said to us kids, kids, If while I'm in prison, I hear that my family is hung to death, rather than deny Christ, I'll be the most proud man in jail. What do you do with that? Where does that fit? Can you sell that to your churches? You know what we're talking about here? We're talking about Christianity 101. We talk about that grain of wheat that falls in the ground. We talk that we we are buried with him. We are... Buried with him in baptism. We, we, we talk about that, 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 that I'm dead, nevertheless I live. And we use all that kind of language. Uh, can you put it in practice? I go to Ukraine. Where did you learn to live like this? Where did you learn to die like this? He said, I remember when my daddy took me and my sister in his arms and said, kids, they're systematically starving believers to death. They killed three million people there, for goodness sakes. They're systematically starving Christians to death who refuse to deny Christ. And he said, kids, if we are called to starve for Jesus, this house will do so with joy. 
What do you do when Jesus shows up? But here's why God has brought Ruth and I to you this week. Because when you go to Islam, especially, and you go to a lot of the major religions on the earth, you're lucky if the persecutor is the government. You're lucky if the persecutor is outside of your family. But, but in Islam, your persecutor is at your breakfast table. Your persecutor is in the bed next to you or in the bedroom with you. Your persecutor will get you and hammer you the first time you're caught with the Bible, first time you watch the Jesus film, the first time you're caught sneaking in the church, and your persecutor takes you out before you ever get to Jesus. They don't. Everywhere, everywhere we find the resurrection being lived, they say, To us, where did you learn? I say to them, where did you learn to live like this, die like this? I learned it from my great-grandfather and my grandfather and my father, and now it's my turn. I learned it from my great-grandmother and my grandmother and my mother, and now it's my turn to give it to my children. In persecution, they have a genealogy of faith stretching back for generations that model for them how to live and die in Christ. But those 2.8 billion people, they have no access to Jesus today. They have no genealogy of faith. You're it. You're it. And you've got to get there. You've got to get there quicker than we're getting there. And when you arrive, you do two things. You open the Word of God and from Genesis through Revelation. Tell the stories of how believers in Almighty God and Jesus Christ is how they live and here's how they die. And you put that book in an appropriate place of honor and you close it and you say to those who are without Christ, if you need to have a clear example of how people live and die in Christ, watch our lives. Watch us with our kids, and we will model for you how to live and how to die in Christ. That's our job. We've got to stand in that gap. We've got to be that person on the tower, be that watchman. And you've got to be able to say in season, out of season, with kids, without kids, married, single, watch my life, and I will begin to build for you a genealogy of faith of how we live and die in Christ until you Have your own. Where's the bar of Christianity for you? Take these, I don't even know how, what number they are. Let them be a mirror. First, they've been a window, because you've got to look through that window to see how people practice their faith around the world. And I have tried my best to move the bar of Christianity off the floor and put it in heaven. I've tried my best. But speaking it and living it, we have found is not the same. Speaking it's easy. Where's the bar of Christianity for you? I want you to look in the mirror and say, what of these things have you incorporated in your lives so that you can live the resurrection where you are right now? You don't need prison to shut you up. We're shutting up without a shot being fired. Let's change that today. Let's change that this week. Let people look at you and understand how we live and how we die in Christ. And look at your children. What of these things are you investing in your spouse? Singles, what of this is in your lives that you're investing in your friends and in your friends that are couples. What of this are you giving in from, from birth? Are you putting in the lives of our children? This is the DNA of the resurrection. I've got a challenge for you. If you're hearing the Spirit of God speak to you, and if you feel that this is truth being spoken, let's stand together and let's commit this time to God. Let's do it. I think what I'll ask is if Ruth will come and pronounce this blessing over us and this challenge.
Jesus, we thank you for this reminder of um, the task that's before us. Father, we lift up our brothers and sisters who've paid big prices so we could hear this today. We pray that those in prisons around the world, those uh, women locked in rooms, those um, believers who are so um, just questioning what to do next, Father, allow them to hear our prayers. Allow them to be strengthened and armed for the journey. Mm. But Lord, allow us to be just broken before you. Remind us of things in our life that we need to uh, apply. Father, allow your word to become so real in our lives. Allow your songs to come forth. And now, Lord, we pray that you will bless each person in this room not so that we can be blessed, but so that we can be a blessing to others. Mm. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen.